You unlock this door with the key of compassion. Beyond it is another world, a world of science, a world of common sense, a world of sanity. You're moving into a land of both empathy and ethics, of nutritional knowledge and empowerment. You've just crossed over into Dr. Osborne's zone. Welcome to the Dr. Osborne Zone. Today, we've got Dr. Evan Hirsch. He is a medical doc who specializes in fatigue, chronic fatigue, and long COVID, among other things. If you've got energy problems, he's got energy solutions. And so happy that we could have him here today to pick his brain. Thanks, Dr. Hirsch, so much for being with us. Thanks for having me on. So let's let's talk a little bit about um long covid that's a topic that a lot of people are you know are top of mind tell me a little bit about your experience with long covid what what kind of person is dealing with long covid yeah it's really interesting because you know when we look at the people who are getting sick from covid itself and they're ending up in the icu and dying and the hospitalizations it's very different from the person who's actually getting long covid the person who's getting long covid is actually younger more athletic Oftentimes they have less severe symptoms, so it's not a really bad flu. Sometimes they'll have um, five or so different symptoms that are more mild and either the symptoms then either just persist or get worse or they go away and then they seem to come back. Um, but those are the people that we're seeing who end up getting long COVID. What um, what do you think is the reason? I mean, you, you mentioned kind of the person we wouldn't maybe not expect or suspect, you know, what do you, what are your underlying thoughts as to why these individuals are, are getting it? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things happening. Um, and I think that the biggest thing is, is having an immune system that's not exactly working right. So a lot of these people, they're, they're exercising, they're doing really well. Um, and oftentimes they're going back to exercise too soon and it kind of compromises their mitochondria. And so, there's this there's this connection here where the immune system is distracted by something that's in the body that's not supposed to be there. So that's usually heavy metals, chemicals, molds, or sometimes it's other infections like Epstein-Barr virus or Lyme or something like that. And that kind of sets the stage. And so when the, the COVID comes into the body, the immune system is distracted. It's off in left field over here so that the COVID comes in and it can kind of get deep into the body. When your immune system is strong enough to get rid of the COVID, that's when you have a really strong reaction. You feel like you're getting the flu. Sometimes it's the worst flu of your life, but the immune system is then getting rid of the of the infection. But it's the heavy metals, the chemicals, the molds, and other infections that are already present that set the stage. And then the COVID's the straw that breaks the camel's back. So the, the COVID comes in, the body kind of mounts a response, beats it back a little bit, but they still have so much other background noise environmentally or, or dietarily that they just don't make a full recovery and they just feel bad, you know, and that's long COVID. Is that is that fair to say? That is fair to say. You know, essentially the immune system's main job is to get rid of things out of the body that aren't supposed to be there. Right. And so if it's not able to get rid of the COVID like it's supposed to, there's something that's that's interfering with it. And that's what we find is that once you get rid of these toxins, it just makes it a lot easier to get rid of the COVID. Let's let's talk about your experience then in working with people, you know, with long COVID. What are the strategies? Are you are you testing to, to determine objectively like what kind of toxic burden they have? Are you detoxing them? Kind of walk us through what that might look like. Yeah, so I have a four-step process that I take people through, whether they have chronic fatigue, ME-CFS, long COVID, or MCAS, mast cell activation. And the first step really is determining what causes they have. Now, fortunately, there's you know 75% of these causes that we're looking at can be determined by symptoms alone. So we always like to look at history and symptoms, but then of course we, we're gonna need labs for some of those and we'll talk about those in just a minute. But we're looking at around 38 different causes, 38 potential causes. And so whenever I see somebody who has one of these different syndromes, it's because they have a number of these and the body is just can't deal with it anymore. So it's usually somewhere around 15 or 20 different causes. Now, when I had my chronic fatigue, I had 30 out of these 38 different causes. And so when you actually know what causes you have, then you can create a map 
you can match up the cause which that you have with a treatment that's going to work for that particular cause and then you can plan yourself out for success you know it's kind of like if you're going on a trip and you don't have a map for how you get there there's no way that you're going to be successful right or if you miss something like mold because you think there's no possible way that i have mold and you don't address it you're not going to be as successful as you could be if you were actually addressing some of those things that um, that you do have. So that's first step. Any questions about that before I go on to the next step? No, no, keep going. It's good. Okay. So then step two is to replace the deficiencies. So when we look at those 38 different causes, we can group them into deficiencies. These are things that are not in the body that are supposed to be there. And toxicities, these are things that are in the body that aren't supposed to be there. Now, this process is all about removing the toxins, kind of like the bad five, like I mentioned before, the heavy metals, the chemicals, the molds, the infections, and trauma. Those are the things that really need to be worked on, need to be removed. However, in order to make people more successful, we need to make them more resilient first. We need to give them a little uptick in their energy, decrease their inflammation, and we do that by starting to replace the deficiencies, working on lifestyle habits, making sure they've got enough good food, good water, good movement, good sleep, um, adrenals, thyroid, mitochondria, which makes 70 to 90% of our energy, uh, B vitamins, vitamin D, um, mineral deficiencies. So boosting those are going to be really valuable for setting people up for success when we get into step four. So that's step two. And then in step three, we start to open up the drainage pathways. So in order to get this crap out of the body that's not supposed to be there, we have to make sure that there's an exit strategy. So we have to make sure that liver, kidney, lymph, neural lymph that's in the brain, intestines, gallbladder, all of those pathways are quote unquote open so that you actually have a place to go when you start to grab the heavy metals, the chemicals, the molds, the infections, and try to get them out of the body. So that's step three. And this is actually one of the main reasons why people, when they have had Lyme or had have had mold and they go for treatment and they just don't feel better, or if they have a lot of sensitivities, or they feel worse during a process, it's because step three hasn't, hasn't been done adequately. If you're grabbing these toxins, trying to get them out of the body, and they got no place to go, you're just going to feel worse. So that's why step three is important. And then we get into step four, which is removing those toxins that we've mentioned. And, and especially with long COVID, it's to make sure that we're also using antivirals that are going to be appropriate, because that's one of the things that we're finding is that and conventionally, they'll say that the the infection is gone after a month, but that's not what we're seeing at all. We're seeing that you have to address it with antivirals in addition to getting rid of the toxins that are inhibiting the immune system from helping you get rid of the infection. So four steps. Step one is identification of what else is there that could be, you know, stumping their immune systems or distracting them from making a full recovery? Step two, um, making sure that they have um, what they need, putting things in their body that are going to be helpful for them to detoxify nutrients, vitamins, etc. Step three is opening up their channels so that, you know, when you start pulling and detoxing, that it has somewhere to go and it doesn't just recirculate. And step four is the actual detoxification process itself. Is that, is that, Fair? That's good. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's talk about some of the nuance then. So um, maybe help us understand how you go about identifying what uniquenesses are with each particular, you know, individual, right? So, you know, is it mold? Is it metals? What? How do you go about determining those types of things beyond the symptom questionnaire, beyond, you know, the, the, the conversation? So that's really where the labs come into play when we're looking at the heavy metals, the chemicals, the molds, you know, those can be assessed by urine tests for the most part. I've, I've been moving away lately from doing a provoked test for heavy metals just because I'm seeing too much recirculation. So now I'm starting to look at serology tests for looking at the heavy metals. So this is looking at the immune system's reaction to the heavy metals. So I still arm wrestle with myself sometimes to determine whether or not I'm going to test for heavy metals by pushing out the metals and collecting in the urine or looking at the immune system's reaction to those. 
but otherwise I'm looking at chemicals in the urine, I'm looking at mycotoxins in the urine. Um, with the infections, oftentimes I'm looking at it based off of the symptoms. You know, if somebody got COVID and they feel worse since COVID, there's a high likelihood that that, that is long COVID. Um, and so you do have to kind of march it back and look at the chronology. With a number of the other um, infections like Lyme, they have and and some of its co-infections, they have very specific criteria, very specific symptoms that are associated with them. So if you got pain on the bottom of the feet, cramps usually in the calves, usually at night, hard time sleeping, and sometimes some anxiety, sometimes some depression, and maybe some thyroid issues. Uh, and maybe you've been misdiagnosed as fibromyalgia and you got some muscle pain, it's highly likely that you have something like Bartonella. So we're kind of looking at all those all those different symptoms plus labs to determine a number of those of those uh, of those different causes. Now, one of the things with some of the nuances is about when to test folks, because oftentimes it's more of a question of how much of these toxins they have versus whether they have them or not. So if I'm not sure if I should test for heavy metals or chemicals or molds in an individual because they, um, they're more sensitive or um, because we're prioritizing other things, then I won't do it. And I will just treat with the knowledge that pretty much everybody that I see has a combination of these. The other thing too, is that once we get people into step three or out of step three, and we open, start to open up the drainage pathways, we get very different test results. And so if we're doing like a mycotoxin test, when I first see somebody and that test is negative, it doesn't show anything. That doesn't mean that they don't have mycotoxins, which are mold toxins in the body, because let's say we wait three months or four months or five months, and we and we do the test at that time, all of a sudden we see a whole bunch of mycotoxins. So it's not like they've had a new exposure. Oftentimes it's just because the pathways are so clogged that you're not going to get an accurate read on a test. So that's kind of um, my thinking around the timing of doing those tests as well. Would you ever consider with somebody on the mycotoxin front pro provoking them like using glutathione or interstitial cysteine in the beginning to to get a confirmation like in the in the suspicion that maybe they are clogged that way if you run the test you don't get a potential false negative yeah i i used to do that a lot before i switched over to mosaic labs used to be known as great plains labs is because they had a reagent that reacted with glutathione and so consequently they didn't they no longer recommended the glutathione provocation um but i have to check to see because i know that sometimes that can help by pushing out the mycotoxins as long as people can tolerate the glutathione um and if they can then oftentimes you can get a more positive result is that what you're seeing yeah that's that's exactly right from what i see um i don't use mosaic but i i i like i do like to provoke simply because i've seen cases where um i had a negative result and I knew I could smell the mold on their clothes. And it's so like, I knew there was a mold problem. Um, why wasn't it coming out? And so in those cases I've provoked and found like an abundance of mycotoxin they, they come out after provocation. So, mm -hmm. um, but I don't always provoke. It's not like the standard that I do because oftentimes you'll see it even without it having to provoke it. And sometimes in my experience anyways, when people are mold, if you, if you use glutathione, some of them react to it. Some of them don't do real well. And I don't want to make somebody feel bad over the sake of trying to do a test either. So it's not like standard that everyone gets a, a glutathione provocation first. Usually I try to find it without it, but. And I think that, you know, historically, oftentimes I find that I don't need the testing initially just because it's like, you know, have you ever lived in a place that had a, a roof leak, a busted pipe, a flood in the basement? And inherently, people will say the first time you ask them that question, they're like, nah, but then they think more about it. And they're like, actually, there was this place that I lived in for this period of time that I did feel worse when I was in. And sometimes they say there was mold on the walls. And if that's the case, it's really significant. But sometimes they'll just say, yeah, there was a, a busted pipe or something like that. So in general, it's uh it's unfortunately way too common and unfortunately um, not enough people understand that it's a big issue. Well, on that note, how, how I, I know there's no way to exact answer this question, but in your experience, how common is it for what you see? You know, 9.5 out of every 10 people, 
you know, so, so, so super common. <laughs> it's yeah. so incredibly common. Yeah, mold is is just really sinister, and um, it can cause a lot of the immune system dysfunction that we see that allows other things to come out and play, other infections to come out and play. A lot of the people who have Lyme, they also have mold, you know, and so it's, and it's never just one thing. And that's also hard sometimes for people to, to get their head around. Yeah, it's multifactorial. I mean, the body is so strong anyway, it has so many redundancies in the immune system. You know, it's, it's, it's when nature has many redundancies of poison right that we can become overwhelmed you know in in that chess match and um mm -hmm. i don't know my experience maybe you could you could um elaborate your experience my experience with long COVID has been uh people were shut down during COVID, and so if they had mold in their house they just felt worse and then COVID came and they never got out of their house like they never went back to work they were always in their house and so they didn't really have an opportunity to get out of their house 10 or 12 hours a day you know to be out of the environment that was you know that was contributing to to part of their problem that that's just something i've seen uh, because i've seen others that were doing really bad and then when they went back to work they started doing better mm -hmm. and that, that's part of how we were able to kind of piece it together yeah anything that pushes people into the home you know here in the pacific northwest it's winter you know and so generally i'm out walking and you know, i work from home and my wife works from home and we're out walking several times a day but it's definitely harder in winter when the rain starts coming you know or you know you're spending your weekends outside but then it gets cold in winter it's snowing outside whatever it is anything that brings you inside so absolutely i've definitely seen the same thing and oftentimes i'll tell people well let's have you go away someplace you know for generally it takes about five days usually to to be able for people to tell a difference and one of the things you taught me was pitch a tent in the backyard if you can you know and that's a great way of doing it that doesn't cost you anything by you know having to go to a hotel or something like that but it gives you a break from your house to see how do you feel feel is your house sick yeah what what do you, once you once you get a person tested kind of get an idea for what their toxic burden is or their toxic level is what what are the strategies you use are there kind of takeaways that our audience can say okay dr dr evan says do these things first or don't do these things at all like are there you know be wary of these things or definitely these are must do's so i like to start with mold and then heavy metals and chemicals, and then the infections. And part of that is because these, these causes don't live in isolation. So they have this relationship with each other where oftentimes they're feeding off of each other or they're bound to each other. So you've got the heavy metals, the chemicals, the molds and the infections all bound up together in what I call like a toxic matrix. And if you go in, if you start using like for people who've had Lyme and they start using antibiotics or some sort of treatment, you're basically like grabbing the infection out of there. And what ends up happening is that the toxic matrix opens up and it releases all the things that were attached to that particular infection. So that's going to be the heavy metals, the chemicals, and the molds. And so if you don't have binders on board, if you don't have some chelators on board, then you're not going to be able to bind up some of those things that get released when you start to go after some of these infections. So I do find that setting up that stage appropriately uh, works really well for folks. Oftentimes with mold, it's that combination of binder plus either N-acetylcysteine or glutathione, depending on what they can tolerate. And with the heavy metals, oftentimes I'm using a combination of natural chelators. I work 100% online now. So even though I've got an MD, I don't prescribe anymore. And everything that I do is is natural supplements, lifestyle management, etc. Do you have an opinion? I know, I know what you're doing now, but Historically, do you have an opinion or have you used things like cholestyramine? There's, that's a popular thing to do with mold. What's your what's your take on that? Yep. Yeah, I used to use that when I had my brick and mortar um, and I was prescribing. And yeah, cholestyramine works very well, but it's very hard for people to tolerate. You have to start at very low levels. You have to compound it. It's incredibly expensive. It tastes awful. It constipates people. So um i didn't find it to be that helpful because very few people could actually tolerate it so i find that that there's a number of binders that i use that are that are generally well tolerated 
or we might have to change the dose if they're not well tolerated. Um, but that seems to work um, really well for folks. And then in terms of the other question, oftentimes from my past that comes up is about, you know, antibiotics for a number of these infections. Well, there's a lot of research on the herbs. And oftentimes when you remove the antibiotics, the infections come back because they just don't get deep enough. And so I do like, I do use very potent herbs that will, you know, give people significant Herxheimer's. So we know that they're working. And so we have to definitely navigate that. And that's a lot of the nuances to get rid of these infections. Plus also that I found that you have a lot more success when you're getting rid of the heavy metals, the chemicals and the molds at the same time as getting rid of the infections. Do you ever have, or have you had any experience where uh, whether with antibiotics or with herbal, you know, herbal antimicrobials, where using them led to like a, a, a yeast overgrowth that caused an exacerbation. I get, I, I get a lot of people that have come from kind of the, the main medicine world and they were put on antibiotics and then they started having severe reactions to the antibiotics. And then we test them and they have, you know, major yeast problem. Now, is that something you've, you've seen as well? with antibiotics or even with antimicrobials because that's the other thing a lot of people just go buy antimicrobials online and then they they take a heavy dose or, and then they may have like super super symptoms right super deep what they call detox or herxheimer response type symptoms but have you have you seen that you know that those cause yeast overgrowth yeah and i think that i've i've seen it with both and I, but I think the reason is, is sometimes different. So when you're using antibiotics, oftentimes, you know, the, um, you're getting, you're getting a dysbiosis from the antibiotic. It's destroying all the good and bad bacteria. And then that fosters the growth of the yeast. Sometimes what's, ha what's happening with the natural herbs, and most of the time the herbs that we're using are doing double and triple duty. So if I'm using something to go after, let's say, Babesia, which is like a Lyme co-infection, oftentimes the components of that are also antifungals. So the only time that that I see yeast popping out is when we get what's called the whack-a-mole effect, where you start to go after a particular infection, and sometimes the infection is bound to another infection, and that infection starts to release. So an example of this, if we were to use like the yeast case, would be, you know, if you know, we, uh, if we're talking about Babesia, oftentimes these people are like the hottest people in the room. They run hot. They have, they oftentimes they've got spontaneous sweating, which is not to be confused with menopausal symptoms. They usually have awful sleep. They'll have anxiety to the point of panic attacks, depression to the point of suicidal thoughts, and they'll have like shortness of breath. And so let's say we're going after Babesia and then all of a sudden they start to get an itchy anus. So itchy anus sometimes is going to be yeast, it could be mold, or it could be parasites. So then, or maybe they've got itchy ears. Itchy anus and itchy ears oftentimes can be one of those three things. So we'll have to see what other symptoms are popping up too, but I call that a whack-a-mole. And so I don't, I don't think necessarily that they're causing the same dysbiosis that the antibiotics are causing, but I do think that they are allowing other infections to kind of come to the forefront. And so oftentimes then we have to address those with maybe a different antimicrobial and kind of keep that in check and then come back to ramping up on our dose of, you know, whatever we're using for Babesia in this case. Okay. Um, so you, you, you go through the process, you use nutrients, you use binders, you use um, microbials or, or, antimicrobials rather herbals um as opposed to to antibiotics and what are, what are your favorite binders are you using charcoal zeolite what what do you what do you find to be helpful yep generally a combination of those charcoals the french clays zeolite you know and the different mycotoxins that it, people have oftentimes require different binders to be used, um, humic and fulvic acids. So, you know, depending on the person, depending on the mycotoxins they have, and depending on how they can navigate the supplements that they need to take are going to determine which binder I'm going to use. Because, you know, some of the humic and fulvic acids, you can actually, because their particle size is small enough, you can actually take them with 
other supplements, which makes it a lot easier to take as opposed to some of these other ones that you have to take about an hour or an hour and a half away from everything, all food and supplements. So um, sometimes that'll play into what I'm doing. Do you, um, do you ever, do you ever do any kind of testing on diet? So like you're, you're doing supplementation to help through these processes, but how do you manipulate a person's diet so that it best supports them? Is there any inflammatory protocol that you use or do you do testing for that as well? Where you're testing for food sensitivity? What does that look like? So I'm pretty simple when it comes to diet, because a lot of times when people come to see me, they've, they've worked on their diet a lot. And it's kind of the last thing that they want to work on. And so I tell them I want them to be gluten-free, dairy-free, sugar-free, alcohol-free, and preservative, artificial stuff-free. Um, and then and mainly, you know, eat meat and veggies, you know, if you, if you are eating meat. So it's more of like a paleo diet sort of thing. And part of that, and I don't, I don't do any food sensitivity testing. Because I find that that helps most people. And there are some nuances to like, I could do food sensitivity testing, and then we could remove maybe one or two foods and, and maybe that'll help them. But it seems like in terms of the time and the cost and the focus, focusing on the step two stuff, which is replacing the deficiencies and modifying the diet and stuff like that distracts from getting to step four, you know, so we want to make sure that that we are really focused on removing the heavy metals, the chemicals, the molds, the infections and the trauma, because those really are the biggest needle movers. Um, so there's no doubt that a food allergy test can potentially help folks, but I just don't find it's the biggest bang for the buck. Um, and when we're dealing with, you know, potentially 38 different causes, um, I try to keep it as simple as possible. What are you seeing as a as a time frame for recovery? So somebody comes in with long COVID, you know, six months, twelve months. What what does that look like on the on the tail end? Yeah, so it really depends on how long they've been sick. But all of our programs are now a minimum of twelve months. They're actually all twelve months. So when I tell people you're going to spend at least twelve months with me, now the goal is for you to be. 80 to 100% better at 12 months. And there are people who are better at 12 months, but a lot of people aren't. And it's really just the reality of how many causes do you have? How severe are those causes? How are you going to react to treatment? And how long is it going to take for those causes to get out of your body? Because when you're looking at heavy metals, chemicals, molds, infections, and trauma, each one of those things on its own will take six to 12 months. Now we try to do them all at the same time, but you have to realize that this is kind of like getting a master's degree in your health. Like you invest the time, energy, and money now, and then you have, you've actually decreased a number of the causes that later in life will, will cause um, heart attacks, heart disease, strokes, uh, Alzheimer's and cancer, right? These are all those same causes that we're talking about. So it's kind of like you invest your time, energy, and money now in order to be able to take care of your symptoms so that you can feel better and you can function, you can enjoy your life. And the added bonus is that you're going to decrease your risk of having a number of these things and potentially you can live longer and stronger. Yeah, it makes sense. So what, um, I'll back up just a little bit. What, so you, you said early on in this conversation that you had chronic fatigue and um, I, I'd love to just hear you talk because with your training, my training is different than yours, your, your, your medical training. Did you, do you have a history where you, you, you had fatigue and you went through kind of traditional medical role model or the medical model, right? Of, uh, of assessment and treatment and were, did you hit it? Again, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but did you go through that model where you went through it and it failed you and then you tried to get better? And so you had to seek out new knowledge and new information in order to make yourself better? Is that because so many doctors that I meet have that as a background for their history when they when they end up in the kind of the, what we would call the natural or alternative realm? It, it's because they they struggled with their own problem. Can you share a little bit about your background and story there? Yeah, well, and what's interesting is that I was actually, I was failed by functional medicine. 
which is really interesting. So I came out of residency in 2007, and I did my first functional medicine training in September of 2007. I, I was already in, when I was in residency in family medicine residency program, I was already practicing acupuncture. I had done the, the Helms medical acupuncture for physicians um, through UCLA. I was practicing, practicing integrative medicine. I was already board certified in holistic medicine through the American Board of Integrative and Holistic Medicine. And so I was already doing all those things. And so I came out, I'm practicing functional medicine. And so part of it was prioritizing myself and taking better care of myself. Um, and so I was fine up until about like 2010. So 2010 to 2015 really were my years when I had chronic fatigue. And so um, I had to start prioritizing myself. I also didn't know I had got I'd gotten most of the people that I had seen in my practice a lot better by focusing on step two, which was replacing the deficiencies, um, managing their um, their lifestyle habits and improving those, um, optimizing their thyroid, you know, decreasing their heart risk by you know working on cholesterol and their fat balances and all that sort of stuff. So. I got a lot of people better by doing that. Now there was a segment of people that were really hard and I knew that I didn't know enough in order to help those people. And those were people that I learned later had heavy metals, chemicals, molds, infections, and trauma, right? So the thing I focus on now were the things that I didn't know then that I had to learn because I had those things. And so then I went on a journey because I was sleeping underneath my desk in this very successful clinic during lunch because I, I felt like crap, right? And so mm -hmm. I was pushing through every day. I was coming home and my daughter would, I had a young daughter at that time and she would say, daddy, play with me. And I couldn't, I was like on the couch. My wife was actually just coming out of fatigue that she had had um, from 2004 to 2007. And she needed me to do the dishes and I couldn't even do the dishes, you know what I mean? So, um, so that was a really, that was a really challenging time for me emotionally, in addition to physically. And so I had to go through a process of figuring out what all these causes were. And I went to environmental medicine, which is a lot of people aren't, you know, not a lot of people know about, but that's really who at that time was talking more about the heavy metals, the chemicals, the molds, the infections, and, and they weren't even talking about the trauma. Trauma was more um, recently. So I started going after those things and I found that I was getting better and better and better, started incorporating them into my practice. And then eventually that became my whole focus, was helping people who were left behind kind of like I was, you know, because unfortunately, I know you've kind of gone in this direction in part because of the struggles that you've also had. But there's a lot of functional medicine docs out there, natural docs, integrative docs who help a lot of people, you know, 90% of the people that they that walk through the door, they can help significantly. But there's that other 10% that they can't. And those are the people that that come to us because they have these other causes that are more challenging. Yeah, that's your story is very similar to mine. And that early in practice, um, you could help a lot of people with some basic fundamental good nutrition and good replacement. And then it just seemed like the more you would help, the more of the sicker and sicker and sicker would start showing up or the ones that you helped to a point wouldn't wouldn't you would plateau out and then you'd have to figure out you'd grow with them. Basically, we had I, I've done a lot of growing, I'm sure, as you have over the years, as you as that's you've fine. been been open to being taught by your patients because that that is where i think a lot of doctors go wrong is the five minute appointment where you can't learn there's no learning you know on either side right doctor can't teach the patient can't teach the doctor the doctor can't teach the patient and so there's no there's no real great growth but i love that you that you had that experience um because it, it just it enriches the people that get to come and see you and, and it enriches yourself how long did it take you to recover once you kind of started getting things figured out where, I mean, I don't want to ask anything too personal if you don't want to share, you know, super personal, but, um, you know, doing, doing kind of what you're doing today, did you find it relatively easy to, to recover or was it a, was it a, was it a long trash? Yeah, it was definitely, uh, um, trials and tribulations. And part of it was that I just didn't, I just didn't have the guidance that I needed from other practitioners, you know, at that time. Um, and I know that I just wasn't able also to be vulnerable, vulnerable enough to reach out for help, you know, because I was, I was, uh, 
in in the position that I was in, and I felt like I had to kind of wear that as a badge and being able. I'm taking care of other people. I don't need other people to take care of myself. So it took a good five years, you know, from that moment where I was like, okay, this is not right. I need to start looking for answers. It took me a good five years. And did you have mold in your background too, or was it other things? I did. Yeah, we had a moldy porch that we removed. Uh, there was also mold in the uh, in the the school that my daughter had been going to that we volunteered a lot in. Um, I had a lot of heavy metals. I grew up eating a lot of tuna fish, and I had mercury amalgams that I had removed. I I had a lot of chemical exposures, you know, the pesticides and the plastics, but then I also had formaldehyde exposure from gross anatomy lab. Um, and then there was trauma, you know, there's trauma with a big T, trauma with a little T, where trauma with the big T oftentimes is what people normally think of when they think of trauma. They think of significant abuse, sexual abuse, mental, emotional, physical abuse. But there's also the little T trauma, which is anything that makes you see your life as as not safe. And so for me, there was, you know, relationships that I had growing up with my parents, with my siblings, where, you know, we're all kind of fighting for our own needs per se, you know, and as a child, you just want to make sure that you survive. And so you're, you're going to bend over backwards in order to be able to make sure your parents get their needs met, you know, but then that doesn't necessarily serve you. So oftentimes the accommodations that you make serve you then, but now don't serve you once you get to be an adult, you know, and so I was pushing, I was hustling for my worthiness to be the best that I could be so that, you know, people would give me kudos and, and so that I would be seen in a certain way. I had rejection of some peer groups when I was growing up that was really hard for me. So a lot of those things kind of played in. And so I was going through my own therapy and my own work, my own mental health, in addition to all the physical stuff to remove those toxins out of my body that really enabled me to get over it. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I know a lot of people will resonate and um, maybe think on their own health and where they're plateaued based on on what you share. And I appreciate it. What um, what advice would you give someone today who's not seeing a doctor or a practitioner? Um, and it's just kind of they're just being turned on to this world, right? This is a whole different world, right? If you're coming over from you know mainstream allopathy to to what we do. Uh, it's like, that's crazy quackery, right? I mean, that that's the perception of the general public, right? I, I'm not, I'm a realist in that way. Um, what would you say to that person who's interested? Where can they start to get the biggest bang for their buck, spending the least amount of money um, and making the biggest amount of difference in their health? So the first place to start, if finances are a challenge, is going to be working on nervous system and limbic system and amygdala retraining. So, you know, I'm I'm generally rec and that's kind of like working on the trauma stuff, even if you don't think you have trauma. And this is also really helpful for people who have MCAS and they've got that sensitivities, uh, more sensitivities to supplements and otherwise and foods. And so I'm generally recommending biology, biology of trauma with Amy Apigian. I'm recommending the Gupta program with Ashok Gupta, where those are lower cost options and they can make a really significant difference in people's um, health. We also have a mindset component to our program and a four-step mindset practice that kind of complements those things. But it's it's really the whole picture that needs to be addressed. So it's kind of like looking first at the number of causes that somebody has. You know, we've got a, a free um, uh, find your causes checklist on our website. If people want to check that out, we're based off your symptoms. You can know 75% of your causes after about an hour of going through this checklist and then working on that nervous system, limbic system, or amygdala retraining. Those are just different parts of the brain uh, the components of the nervous system that can really be helpful. And then, you know, figuring out what your causes are and then finding somebody who actually is specializing in what you're dealing with. So, you know, if you want to take, if you want to learn how to play the piano, you don't go to your mechanic unless they're, you know, a piano virtuoso, right? You want to go to somebody who's actually an expert in that, right? So you look for somebody like Peter or me who, you know, if you've got chronic fatigue or long COVID, you want to make sure that it's on their website, that this is what they do all the time, because that's just going to compress time for you. Because, you know, there's so many people out there who can tell you, I've been sick for 
10 years, 15 years, 20 years, right? We still see those people who we're having calls with. And so much of it is because they've been messing around with the local naturopath, functional medicine doc, whoever, who is working on those 90% who they can get better. And part of it is that most docs don't want to work on heavy metals, chemicals, molds, infections, and trauma. There, each of those things is like getting an additional degree for us because of the amount of time, energy, um, and knowledge that we need to acquire those things. So if you want to shorten the amount of time that it takes for you to get better, you need to find somebody who's already done it, doing it for a lot of people, has reviews on their website that says that they've done it for a lot of people and that you resonate with because you're going to be spending a lot of time with them. You know, So you get on a call with them or you watch some videos and you see, is this somebody whose philosophy I resonate with? And then the last thing I would say is for folks who are more conventional, all of the conventional folks that I work with who are successful are more open. So, you know, I spoke the other day with a, a doctor in physical therapy, you know, highly intellectual and and was at a point, also had um, uh, mast cell activation syndrome, so highly sensitive to things, had long COVID and also chronic fatigue. Um, and now they were open because they realized that they weren't having success with the conventional establishment or even with functional medicine providers, they were now more open to other things because I was asking them about muscle testing because we teach sway testing and pendulum testing because we find that that's just a different source of data. This is applied kinesiology. And so she said, yeah, I'm now open to those things. I wasn't open to those before, but now I know enough to know that, um, that in order for me to get better, I have to be open to these things. Yeah, yeah, well said. I think, you know, if you if you keep doing what you've been doing and you're not getting a result, then you're gonna keep getting what you've been getting. And so to be <laughs> to be open to something new is is um of course important on that on that journey. Interesting. So great advice. Uh, I love it. This has been a, a very good interview. I appreciate you know, appreciate you, appreciate what you do, appreciate the work you do. And um, I really appreciate your time today and, and helping teach our audience, hopefully some things they can unpack after this and really go home and, and, uh, and help themselves with. Thanks so much for having me on, Peter. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're very welcome. It's good seeing you. And maybe we'll do part two here in, this, in the future. Sounds good. All right. Thanks for tuning in to the Dr. Osborne Zone. Don't forget to share, like, and subscribe for more content like this. And make sure you come back next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time and Thursday at noon 30 for more episodes.